The 25th of July, 1956. A luxury ocean liner of the Italian line steams through thick fog en route to New York. The graceful ship is mere hours from its destination as it passes south of the Nantucket Shoals. But fate would have it that it would never make it. Struck by another transatlantic passenger ship heading in the opposite direction, a perfect storm would form to sink what would incorrectly be deemed an unsinkable ship. And while all this would seem like the makings of an incredible tragedy and an overwhelming loss of life, the story of the Andrea Doria is astounding not for its terrible tragic nature, but for the incredible rescue that followed, and the astounding amount of lives that were saved that warm July night off the coast of Massachusetts. During World War II, the Regia Marina, Italy's navy, had suffered. Once the fifth largest navy in the world, the early 1940s had cut that number to a shadow of its former self. The merchant marine was in shambles, and Italy needed a way to bounce back and restore national pride. In the early 50s, the Italian line, or Italia di Navigazione, commissioned the construction of two ocean liners, the Cristoforo Colombo and the Andrea Doria. On the 9th of February 1950, the keel for the Andrea Doria was laid out in the Ansaldo shipyards in Genoa, Italy. The ship wasn't the fastest or the largest in the world, but it could be argued that she was the most luxurious. Hiring famous architect and city planner Giulio Minoletti, as well as artists Gio Ponti and Nino Zancata, and many others. Ponti having worked on other ocean liners such as Conti Biancamano and the Conte Grande. The ship would be a floating art gallery, a reminder of the Italy that grew famous for its great works of art. Art from great Renaissance painters such as Michelangelo and Raphael, but also have a trendy and modern feel to it. Each section of the ship, from first class to tourist class, was beset with works of art and fine living. Each class featured its own arrangements from dining halls to bars to theaters. Each class even had its own outdoor swimming pool. In the first class lounge was a mural adorning the wall that covered 1,600 feet of wall space. In the middle of the lounge stood a giant bronze statue of the ship's namesake, 16th century Admiral Andrea Doria clad in full armor and resting upon a sword nearly half his height. In total, the company had spent over a million dollars on art alone for the ship. The ship had numerous quality of life amenities too, like air conditioning in every room and a telephone system throughout the ship. Andrea Doria was an exotic and cultural experience. In an age of air travel cutting the time for transatlantic crossings to a fraction, it seemed only a matter of time before the ocean liner went extinct. But Doria wouldn't be that death. In many experts' opinions, it was the SS United States that did the ocean liner in. Being built around the same time, the United States was bigger, faster, could carry more, and could do it in less time than the Doria. But for many writers at the time, the United States was missing something. Life. She was described as cold, utilitarian, bland, like sitting in a hotel crossing the ocean, but not the Andrea Doria. In an Italian line promotion for the ship, they had this to say. First of all, a ship that is worthy of the name must be a ship. She must be able to function as a huge machine, to provide light and heat and numerous essential hotel services to her passengers. She must be able to cleave the ocean waves efficiently and safely, no matter what the weather conditions. She must get her passengers where they want to go with reasonable dispatch, adhering to a schedule announced in advance. But today, a ship must be more than that. For the period of her voyage, she must be a whole way of life for her passengers. She must provide them with an experience that will somehow be different and better than a comparable experience they could have anywhere else. This experience must be one that they will enjoy while they have it, and one they will never forget as long as they live. The Andrea Doria is, we think, unique. She was designed to be a huge, completely efficient machine, a real ship. She was also designed as a living testament to the importance of beauty in the everyday world. Andrea Doria was indeed this and more. In her time, shuttling such well-known names as John Ford, Tennessee Williams, John Steinbeck, Cary Grant, and Orson Welles, providing luxury to its passengers as well as top-of-the-line safety. The vessel possessed a top-of-the-line fire suppression system and its own dedicated shipboard fire brigade, something many would find a relief after such tragedies like the Morro Castle, which occurred a little over a decade before the Doria even set sail for the first time. 
On top of fire suppression, the Andrea Doria was very hard to sink, having installed 12 transverse watertight bulkheads, each stretching from the ship's double bottom hull to the ship's A deck. Any two of these watertight compartments could be punctured before the ship would lose stability. The ship also had multiple redundant pumps with emergency backup generators. The ship could reach a 20 degree list before losing stability, all of which was within standing or exceeding the standards set down by the 1948 SOLAS Convention, or Safety of Life at Sea. SOLAS being the convention established to regulate safety standards at sea started in 1914 after the Titanic disaster. Navigation was made a breeze. The risk of collision or grounding was believed to be almost nil, with two radar consoles, radar direction finding equipment, and the relatively new invention of Loran. The Andrea Doria herself was around 29,000 tons. From bow to stern, she was just a few inches shy of 702 feet, or 213.8 meters. She was 90 feet 3 inches, or 27.5 meters at the beam, and was 11 decks high. She was propelled by steam turbines with twin shafts, and though not the fastest, she still could move along her transatlantic route at an impressive 23 knots. On board, she carried around 1,200 passengers and 500 crew. Launched on the 16th of June, 1951, she was blessed by the Cardinal Archbishop of Genoa, Giuseppe Siri. The ship was then christened by Miss Giuseppina Surrogate, who was the wife to former minister of the Italian Merchant Marine, Giuseppe Surrogate. Which leads me to wonder if they just grabbed every Giuseppe in Genoa and ushered them to the ship's launch that day. But I digress. After her launch, her sea trials and maiden voyage wouldn't be until the 14th of January, 1953 whereupon her captain for the entirety of her lifespan would take command, Captain Piero Calamai. The 58-year-old Genoa native had served in the Italian surface fleet in both world wars, joining the Navy at 19 in 1916. In his service, he received the Italian War Cross for valor before joining the Merchant Marine in 1919. While in the Merchant Fleet, he served aboard the Conte Biancamano, the Conte di Savoie, and the Conte Grande. Whilst aboard the Conte Grande, he received yet another medal for valor when he leapt overboard to save a passenger who had fallen overboard. During the Second World War, he once more joined the Italian Navy, receiving yet another Italian war cross for valor when he sailed to the rescue of the Italian battleship Ciao Duglio after she was torpedoed by British planes launched by HMS Illustrious. Calamai used his ship to push the battleship to shallow water to ground it, saving the battleship and much of its crew. The man was courageous and beloved by his crew. He was a fair disciplinarian and accomplished at his job. He kept to an excellent time schedule, maintained a diligent watch, and kept his officers and crew on task. His only shortcoming, at least in the Italian line's eye, was that he was antisocial. He loathed the meetings and greetings and whining and dining that came with being the captain of an ocean liner, often passing it off to his second in command, second captain Osvaldo Maganini. He would opt in to about two dinners a trip, or taking passengers of high status up to the bridge for a tour. But otherwise, he'd take his meals in a small officer's mess with the other officers, or even up on the bridge itself. During her maiden voyage and shakedown cruise, the ship performed well enough. But it was noted that when her fuel tanks ran low, the ship tended to ride high out of the water. This would cause the ship to list dangerously in any sort of weather, which the ship ran into on her first crossing. The ship listed over 25 degrees at one point, before self-riding. Around 20 passengers received minor injuries during this event. This was later alleviated by filling the empty fuel tanks with seawater to ballast her down. But this would later prove to be time-consuming, requiring the tanks to be emptied and cleaned each port call. On the 17th of July, 1956, the Andrea Doria set out on its 51st westbound crossing of the Atlantic, and Captain Calamai's last crossing before he transferred to the Cristoforo Colombo. By this time, the Italian line was transporting around 100,000 passengers across the Atlantic per year, second only to the Cunard line. Starting in Genoa, the next few days, she would stop in Canet, Naples, and finally Gibraltar, picking up passengers on each stop before steaming out into the Atlantic and into her great circle course towards New York. The trip would be relatively short, the Andrea Doria due in port on the 26th of July at 6 a.m. local time. Andrea Doria could carry 1,241 passengers, and this trip she was carrying 1,134. 190 first class passengers, 267 cabin class, and 677 tourist class, 
with a crew of 572. That rounded the total up to 1,706 on board. She was also carrying 401 tons of freight, 522 pieces of luggage, 1,754 bags of mail, and 2 million in furniture, olive oil, wine, fabrics, and assorted food. Andrea Doria soon passed out of the Mediterranean, passed close to the Azores. Not long after, she was thrust into some bad seas, rocking the ship back and forth for days on end. Many aboard grew seasick during the trip, especially those in the lower cabins, without ease of access to fresh air, the tourist class cabins, which, mind you, were by no means the cheap seats. While yes, they weren't as glamorous as the top dollar first class cabins, they were still very nice and by no means cheap. A tourist class ticket could set one back as much as $205 to $250, which, adjusted to inflation by today's standards, puts it anywhere between $2,200 and $2,700. A cabin class ticket was $260 to $300, or $2,800 to $3,200, and the top dollar first class tickets were around $335 to $360, which, adjusted to inflation, is $3,600 to $3,900. All the same, the Andrea Doria plowed on through the rough seas, losing a bit of time, but not much. Some aboard grew sick, but others found the rough seas to be exciting and exhilarating. Of course, none fearing that the massive ship was under any sort of danger. Ironically enough, the Walter Lord book, A Night to Remember, released only a few months earlier. The wildly successful book about the sinking of the Titanic was critically acclaimed. Many survivors of the Doria remember buying it for the trip across the Atlantic. The thought of the Titanic being burned into their brain from the book as they crossed. But the bad weather didn't keep the passengers from eating. On a typical nine-day voyage, the ship will go through 50,000 eggs, 1,500 pounds of meat and fish, and around 2,000 pounds of fruit and vegetables, as well as 150 pounds of coffee and tea a day, on top of 100 gallons of milk and 200 gallons of wine. But weather aside, Captain Calamai was able to keep the throttle down to make up time for getting into New York. It wasn't until the night before entering port that they came across a patch of dense fog off the coast of the U.S. At this time of year, it wasn't uncommon for cold waters from Nova Scotia to react to warm waters from the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of New England, creating dense patches of fog. This was an occurrence that Captain Calamai was not unfamiliar with, and he was no slouch about it. He was already on the bridge when he recognized the fog approaching before the rest of the crew. He ordered additional lookouts and ordered the closing of the ship's watertight doors, and activated the ship's sound signals. Finally, it came time to check down on the ship's speed. He called down to the engine room to reduce steam pressure, but the effect only reduced the ship's speed by a few knots, from 23 knots to around 21 knots. While it is in good seamanship to reduce speed in restricted visibility, this was almost a token gesture, and scarcely close to the speed he should have come to. The rule of thumb typically being to reduce the speed to be able to stop the ship within half the distance of visibility. But some reported the distance of visibility to be almost the width of the ship. The mass of Doria didn't stop quickly, so to remain within that rule of thumb, the ship would have to nearly stop entirely. But the ship was on a time frame. In New York, there would be over 250 longshoremen waiting, being paid $250 an hour, starting from the time they arrived, whether the Andrea Doria was there or not. Captain Calamai had traveled the foggy waters off Nantucket before. He was confident that they would be fine. The decision wasn't made alone, either. While the captain was on the bridge, getting off watch was First Officer Luigi Onetto, who was passing it to Senior Second Officer Curzio Francini and his companion for that watch, Junior Third Officer Eugenio Giannini, who busied themselves fixing positions and manning the radar. Francini was a sailor for 18 years, a veteran of the Italian Navy, and had been on Andrea Doria since the previous autumn. Giannini, his younger by eight years, was six months out of the Italian Naval Academy, but had been serving on various ships since 1949. At no point from entering the fog to the point of collision did Captain Calamai leave the bridge. That evening, a ship left New York en route across the Atlantic, bound for Copenhagen, the Swedish-American line ship, the MS Stockholm. At 12,165 tons, it was a good deal smaller than Andrea Doria. 525 feet or 160 meters in length and 69 feet or 21 meters at the beam, she was one of the smallest transatlantic ocean liners at the time. 
She carried only 534 passengers at a paltry speed of 18 knots. She was small, white, and sleek with a steeply peaked bow. But due to sailing the frigid waters of the North Atlantic, she featured a heavily reinforced bow. Not exactly an icebreaker, the bow was designed to cut through light ice. She was almost 10 years older than the very new Andrea Doria, yet still within her prime. Pulling out behind the massive ocean liner, the Ile de France, the Stockholm made best speed out towards the Nantucket lightship, as the Ile de France, being much faster, pulled ahead and left Stockholm in the night. At around 8 p.m., third officer Johan Ernst Bogislas August Karstens Johansson took the bridge watch. Unlike Andrea Doria, it was common practice for the smaller ship to have only one officer on the bridge as opposed to two. A younger officer, he had not been sailing on the Stockholm for long. This would be his first shift as the ship's conning officer. But he was still a fairly competent mariner, having received his master's papers in 1953 after graduating from the Swedish Navigational College. Stockholm wasn't Karsten's first ship either. He was young, but in the opinion of the Stockholm's captain, very competent. The Stockholm's captain was Harry Gunnar Nordensen. The 63-year-old captain had around 46 years of maritime experience and was noted as an experienced and able mariner and a hard taskmaster. At around 9 p.m., the captain came up to the bridge to mark the progress of the ship, check its course, and ensure things were going smoothly. It was noted at this time that the ship was tracking slightly north and close to the Nantucket lightship. At this time, something known as the North Atlantic Track Agreement existed. This was an agreement among several passenger steamship companies on pre-designated routes for passenger ships to travel when traversing from North America to Europe and set inbound and outbound traffic lanes, similar to the traffic separation schemes we see today. Stockholm would have been traversing outbound in the inbound channel if not for two reasons. One being the Swedish-American line wasn't part of the track agreement, and even if they were, it was more of a guideline than a hard set of laws. So in spite of being closer to the lightship and being set north by either winds or current, Captain Nordensen was unconcerned. He retired below, asking 3rd Officer Karstens to notify him when the lightship came up on radar. The Stockholm had not yet entered the fog bank that the Andrea Doria was currently traversing, and any sign of it hadn't been spotted. So eastbound, the Stockholm sailed, while the Andrea Doria powered westbound through the fog. On the bridge of the Andrea Doria, Captain Kalamai hadn't retired to his cabin. In truth, the man was a worrier, and scarcely left the bridge unattended for long. He paced the length of the bridge back and forth, popping out on the bridge wing, walking to the radar, then checking to ensure the helmsman was on course. The ship was socked in on all sides by fog, but the ship's Raytheon radar was suitable enough to detect any contact that approached them. Dondria Doria approached the Nantucket lightship at a distance of around a mile, but never saw it. The iconic lightship marking the southernmost end of the rather expansive Nantucket shoals to the south of the island. It was also a common waypoint for vessels inbound to New York. Once a beam of the lightship, the Andrea Doria turned to 263 degrees and began their final track into New York. This was around 10.20 p.m. About 20 minutes later, a blip appeared on the radar some 17 miles out and around 4 degrees to the starboard, approaching Andrea Doria. With early radar and at this range, it was impossible to tell the size of an approaching ship. It could be a fishing ship heading into Nantucket, or it could be an outbound freighter. But due to the fact that it was in the inbound channel heading outbound, Captain Kalamai and the other bridge officers came to the conclusion that it was likely a small fishing ship. On top of that, based upon its current course, it would pass them to the north at about a nautical mile. He ordered the ship a few degrees to port to increase the distance of a starboard to starboard passing. According to the modern rules of the road, in the interest of good seamanship, it's a rule that you do not turn to port for a vessel spotted with radar forward of your bow. But at the time, the vessel was said to have been obviously a bit to starboard. It's still within a captain's right to pass another vessel starboard to starboard if it's safe to do so. But no arrangements were made over the radio telephone or telegraph. In fact, in the rules of the time, a passing arrangement wasn't needed to be made. But on top of this, a radar plot was never made on the Andrea Doria to be certain that the vessel was indeed going to pass starboard to starboard. Around the same time, the Stockholm was seeing the Andrea Doria on her radar screen as well. But again, the ship wasn't visible and Karstens had no idea who it was. 
But being diligent, he did begin a radar plot using something known as a maneuverability board, or MO board. The officer would plot the ship's position on the board using the radar, wait a few minutes, and then plot it again. With this, he could determine the ship's course, speed, distance it would pass, etc. Using this, he determined that the Andrea Doria was to his port, and would pass safely to his port side. But to be safe, he ordered the ship a few degrees to starboard. Karsten's helmsman at the time was Danish-born Petter Larsen. Karsten's quickly noticed the new helmsman was not the best at his job. He was easily distracted by what else was going on on the bridge, and had to be reminded several times by Karsten's to pay attention to the compass as the bow swung back and forth, causing a noticeable zigzag in their course. He finally ordered the helmsman to maintain nothing to the left of 089 degrees meaning the helmsman was supposed to steer a 089 degree course and never pass to the port of that. Minutes ticked by as the two ships approached, the Stockholm thinking the Doria was to her port, and the Doria thinking the Stockholm was to her starboard. Neither ship could see the other, the Doria still in a fog bank, while the Stockholm, according to Karstens, was outside the fog bank, and apparently didn't see the fog yet. Karstens worried about how close the radar contact would pass, and ordered a 20 degree turn to starboard to increase the distance they would pass. On board the Andrea Doria, Captain Calamai was worried about the same thing. To his starboard was the approaching ship. To turn starboard would leave her crossing its bow. On top of this, the Nantucket Shoals loomed to the north, somewhere in the fog. But south and to port was open and safe waters. He ordered a turn to port into the south. The entire time the bridge team trying to see the ship ahead of them in the fog. Just after 11 p.m., the bridge crew spotted the lights of the Stockholm. To their shock, they watched the bow of the Stockholm swing from port to starboard, crossing directly into their path. Captain Calamai ordered an immediate turn hard to port, ordering the engines maintained to attempt to pass ahead of the turning Stockholm. On Stockholm, Karstens watched in horror as the massive Andrea Doria materialized from the fog, less than a nautical mile away, and passing in front of his bow. He ordered a hard turn to starboard and the engines thrown into reverse. The diesel engines on board Stockholm allowed the ship to stop faster than Andrea Doria, but there just wasn't enough time. At 11.11 p.m., the reinforced bow of the Stockholm sliced into the side of the massive Italian ocean liner, just abaft her bow nearly in line with the bridge. It cut a huge hole in the side of the ship, penetrating some 40 feet into the side of the Andrea Doria as it plowed into it going around 18 knots. Both ships shuddered heavily. Passengers who were asleep in anticipation of departing the ship in the morning were thrown from their beds. The Stockholm came to a violent stop as its bow crumpled inwards, instantly killing several crew sleeping in forward cabins in the bow. The ship twisted as the forward momentum of the Doria carried it along, twisting the bow and the gaping wound in the side of the stricken Italian ship, like a knife twisting in a gut to inflict more damage. Finally, the bow of the Stockholm pulled free before bumping along the side of the Andrea Doria, before falling off behind her. In the bow, the collision had destroyed the ship's chain locker, causing a good bit of wreckage in the entirety of the ship's anchor chain to spool out and sink to the ocean's floor, essentially anchoring the ship in place. Captain Nordensen charging up to the bridge to find out what had happened, only to find a shocked Karsten stammering, Collision! We collided with another ship! She came from the port! From the port! He immediately began ordering damage control efforts, telling Karstens to plot exactly what he had done. But the perfect storm was forming on the struck Doria. Despite the fact that only one watertight compartment was punctured by the bow of the Stockholm, water was pouring in and she was taking on a very heavy list. Something that shouldn't be happening. The issue being that when the ship was punctured, the bow split open five large fuel tanks on the starboard side, all five of which were empty and should have been filled with seawater to ballast, but were left empty to save time and money. On the port side were also large fuel tanks that were now adding buoyancy to the port side, forcing the ship over and causing it very quickly to list. In minutes, the ship had listed past its 15 degree maximum and beyond. Captain Calamai remembered his time in the Navy, saving the Chao Dulio by running her aground. It was a long shot, but if he could run Doria up into the nearby Nantucket Shoals, he could likely save her. He ordered the engines ahead, slow, 
as the ship began to creep forward and shudder. A call from engineering put an end to this idea. Only the port engine was still working, and even then, likely not for long. He ordered the engine secured. The Andrea Doria carried 16 lifeboats, of varying size and construction. In total, with all the lifeboats, they could carry 2,008 passengers, far in excess of the number of souls on board Doria. They were held in dual-arm gravity davits, a common davit system that could easily lower boats safely and without power from the ship. Only a handful of crew were needed to remove the boat from its cradle and lower it to the promenade deck for boarding. It's a near foolproof system with one issue. If the ship lists past 15 degrees, the boats on the high side can't be launched. The boats on the low side can, but must be loaded in the water by lowering passengers over the side on ropes or Jacob's ladders. With the ship listing so heavily, half of the lifeboats sat uselessly in their cradles. No effort, no matter how large, could lift the heavy boats out of their cradles, and Captain Calamai soon realized that he could only safely disembark around 1,004 passengers and crew. The determination was made that the crew would launch the boats that could be launched, but the abandoned ship alarm would not be sounded to avoid a panic on board until more lifeboats could be attained. At 11.20, a distress call was sent out. SOS Day, India Charlie Echo Hotel. Andrea Doria's call sign. SOS here at 0320 Greenwich Mean Time, latitude 40 degrees 0 .30 north, 69 degrees 0 .53 west. Need immediate assistance. The distress call transmitted over 500 kilocycles, the, at the time, distress frequency, was heard far and wide. Coast Guard stations along the shore heard the call and relayed it. Seven different Coast Guard cutters were routed to aid the stricken ship, the Tamaroa, the Oahuasca, and the Campbell to name a few. But even closer was the C-1B cargo ship, the Cape Ann, just 15 miles away, which within minutes turned to assist with the ensuing disaster. Nearby also was the Navy transport ship, Private William H. Thomas. 17 miles away, the transport was ferrying military personnel and their families from Europe home to the States. Without hesitating, they heeded the distress call and came about to assist. But the Cape Ann carried only two lifeboats. The William H. carried a few more. But the Andrea Doria had 1,700 passengers to offload. They needed more boats. On board, a call went out over the ship's loudspeaker for passengers to remain calm and to head to their muster stations. The atmosphere on board after the collision was mixed. Many remained calm, though were curious as to what happened. Yet as the ship began to list heavily to starboard, panic spread quickly throughout the ship. There was a general atmosphere of confusion as mixed reports of what had happened floated around, many believing there was an explosion in the engine room. Others thought the ship had struck an iceberg, but several soon learned the truth upon discovering the massive hole in the side of the ship. The ship's ladder wells, passageways, and stairways became congested with passengers scrambling to get to the top decks, many in varying states of dress having just woken up. Many didn't bother to dress. The alarming rapidity at which the ship was heeling over led them to believe that the ship was sinking faster than it actually was, believing they only had mere moments before it capsized. Some passageways became so congested the passengers reported it taking as much as 90 minutes for them to get topside. In the engineering spaces, engineers scrambled to write the list of the ship, running pumps to try and pump out the flooded spaces. An attempt was made to fill the tanks on the port side to counter ballast, but too quickly the ship listed, the intakes for the ballast pumps rising high out of the water and becoming useless. A tunnel ran along the keel of the ship, from the tank rooms that were flooding to the generator spaces. In spite of the best efforts of the crew, the generator space slowly filled with water. One by one, the generators were shut off as seawater reached them. Power was prioritized to the lights and the ship's davits. The list grew so heavy that engineers had to remove their shoes just to get grip on the deck plates. Then ropes were strung up to hang on to. With the generators dedicated to lighting, the engine rooms became sweltering. Cold seawater contacted hot machinery and produced steam. The men battled to the last moment to save the ship before fleeing the space. The ship experiencing temporary darkness until the backup generators on the upper deck kicked in. As the ship heeled over, many passengers fled to the high side, waiting for any kind of instructions. Unbeknownst to them, on the low side, boats were being loaded. But shamefully, the vast majority were crew members. Waiters, cooks, stewards, 
Non-sailors who, while not necessary to the ship's evacuation, still put their lives before the lives of the passengers, throwing the age-old adage of women and children first to the wind. Back on the stricken Stockholm, an inspection of the ship showed that the damage, though heavy, had apparently only crumpled the bow to one of the watertight bulkheads, which was miraculously holding water. Several crew members perished on impact, others were pulled from the twisted wreckage, but the ship was at no risk of sinking. After a bit of ballasting, it was even brought to an even keel. During an inspection of the bow, a Spanish crewman Bernabe Polanco Garcia heard yelling on the bow in Spanish, a girl calling for her mother. The crewman found a surprising sight, a girl, Linda Morgan, on the bow in the tangle of wreckage, her arm broken. Freeing the girl, she was brought inside the ship's infirmary. On the way there, the girl was stopped by the Stockholm's chief purser, Kurt Dawe, who asked her for her name to check the passenger list for her. She responded in English, Linda Morgan, where's my mother? Do you know where my mother is? Daw promised to look for the woman as he checked the passenger manifest for the 14-year-old Spanish girl. Linda then told him to look for Cianfara. Confused, the man asked, where do you come from? To which she replied, Madrid. Finally, seeing the strange surroundings, the girl responded, I was on the Andrea Doria, where am I now? Indeed, the girl was asleep in cabin 52 on Andrea Doria with her half-sister, her mother, and her stepfather. All the others had perished in the collision as the bow of the Stockholm collided directly with their cabin. Linda had been knocked unconscious and then deposited on the bow of the Stockholm as it pulled away, receiving only a broken arm, but surviving. A crewman had spotted a woman in the wreckage on the bow and went to assist her. She was seated upright in the very edge of the bow, entrapped in the wreckage, but she was no longer alive. Efforts to remove her were in vain and had to be abandoned. Her body was lost to the sea later as portions of the bow fell away. But she wasn't Miss Cianfara, Linda Morgan's mother. This was Miss Carlin from Cabin 46. In fact, Miss Cianfara was still aboard the Andrea Doria, entangled with the wreckage of her cabin. She would survive for several hours as crew and passengers attempted to extricate her, only to succumb to her wounds around four in the morning. Linda wouldn't learn of this until a few days later, but the 14-year-old would still be hailed as the miracle girl of the Andrea Doria, despite living for many years with horrible survivor's guilt. Finally, over the telegraph, a call came from the Andrea Doria, begging the Stockholm for assistance. The ships were around a mile distant. Doria asked for Stockholm to come to assist with offloading passengers, to which Captain Nordensen explained that he could not. His ship was damaged and they were stuck to the bottom. He instructed Calamai to lower his lifeboats and row them to the Stockholm, to which Calamai countered that they could not, the list being too heavy. Nordensen conferred with his chief mate, who assured him that the ship was in no danger of sinking. Finally, the captain agreed to send three of his eight lifeboats to assist the stricken Doria. The ocean liner Ile de France received the SOS call as well, leaving Captain Raoul de Boudin with a difficult decision to make. The Ile de France was well on her way to France by this time, loaded down with even more passengers than Doria. If the near 800-foot ship were to come about, they would have to return to New York to refuel. Every passenger would be late and need to be compensated. If the SOS turned out to be nothing, or if the Doria ended up not needing the Ile de France's assistance, it could cost the company exorbitant amounts of money. But if they did in fact need Bodan's assistance, then ignoring the call could potentially doom hundreds of passengers. Captain Boudin called the Andrea Doria, seeing what the issue was. Doria, do you need assistance? The immediate response was, need immediate assistance, which didn't offer much help. But hearing the chatter to other ships, it was gleaned that Andrea Doria needed more lifeboats, desperately. The Ill had more than enough lifeboats to offload all the passengers onto Andrea Doria. Bodan responded once more, Captain Andrea Doria, I'm going to assist you. We'll reach your position 535 GMT, or 135 AM. Are you sinking? What kind of assistance do you need? The response came from the Cape Ann for the Doria, her telegraph system failing. SOS message, Doria, wants to disembark 1,500 passengers and crew. Suggest strongly you have all your lifeboats ready to assist. So the decision was made. The French ocean liner came about. Without awakening her passengers, the ship readied her lifeboats, gathered blankets, and prepared hot meals as they seemed to the Doria. Back at the Andrea Doria, ropes were thrown over the side as people streamed down into the lifeboats below. 
but the vast majority didn't wear the orange life jackets stamped with Italia that the passengers wore, but instead wore the gray life jackets of the crew. Stewards, cooks, and waiters flocked to the few lifeboats from the Stockholm, climbing in and shoving passengers out of the way as they fled the ship. The boats returned to the Stockholm half empty and with mostly crew from the Doria. The first boat was half empty, carrying 40 crew members and only four passengers. In total, the Stockholm received the vast majority of the crew, receiving 234 crew and 311 passengers. But soon, on the Doria, word was spread that boats were being loaded on the lower starboard side. The most harrowing ordeal of the night would now come as hundreds of passengers now attempted to get down the steep, sometimes more than 30 degree slope from the high port side to the lower starboard side, many losing their footing and sliding down the steep deck, crashing into the furniture, bulkheads, and the piled up luggage on the deck, placed there in anticipation of offloading the next day. Several were injured or bruised, some received broken bones. Passengers flooded over the side in a panic, many choosing to leap into the dark oil slicked water, avoiding floating debris or landing directly into lifeboats that could be as much as 50 feet below them. Many scrambled down ropes and fire hoses tied to the side. Some crew scrambled to use nets that covered the swimming pools as makeshift scramble nets. A useful tool for a spry young sailor or marine, but for an elderly passenger, were near impossible to traverse without getting entangled. A 53-year-old woman from Pennsylvania, Miss Julia Greco, attempted to leap into a boat and broke her back. She survived for six months in the hospital before succumbing to her injuries. Another man attempted to drop his four-year-old daughter into a boat below. He called down to the crew on the boat before dropping her, but they didn't hear him. The girl hit her head on the gunwale of the lifeboat and never woke up after. She died in a Boston hospital a few days later. As more passengers realized rescue was here, panic and bedlam spread through the listing ship. Passengers scrambled as best they could down to lifeboat, but felt not much safer as they sat in the boats waiting to disembark, the massive ship looming over them. Many remember feeling as if the ship would roll right over on top of them while they waited. There was one dramatic change in atmosphere though. Shortly before 2 a.m., the fog lifted slowly as a large looming shape approached from the east, lit by a pair of white mast headlights and a port navigation light. Captain Baudin of the Ile de France ordered, turn on the lights, all the lights, and let them know we're here. The deck lights and floodlights illuminated the massive Ile de France as she approached the Andrea Doria starboard side. Even the ship's name written in massive 10-foot block letters were illuminated. Boats were lowered from the French ocean liner as a veritable flotilla of lifeboats streamed their way over to the stricken ocean liner. A great sense of relief and ease flooded over the passengers upon seeing the French ocean liner pull up close. The massive ship was even acting as a windbreak and creating a man-made lagoon of calm water between the two ships. Many passengers remember thinking for the first time that night that they would make it now that the Ile de France was there. The Ile de France arrived at around 2 a.m. and the abandonment of the ship proceeded at a much smoother pace. Around 3.30 a.m. the ship had only a handful of passengers still on board. The Stockholm ended up taking on a total of 545 survivors before she was able to cut away the, her anchor chains that kept her trapped and limped back to New York. The freighter Cape Ann took on 129 survivors with her two lifeboats, the Private William H. Thomas about 159. But the true savior of the night was the Ile de France, taking on an incredible 753 passengers, giving them blankets and hot food, as well as a deck to stand on that was no longer listing. At four in the morning, second Captain Maganini reported all passengers off the ship to Captain Calamai. By now the ship had close to a 40 degree list to starboard and was likely to roll over it at any time. In truth, Maganini was wrong. There was still one passenger still on board, possibly the last on board, 35-year-old Robert Lee Hudson. The man was asleep in the ship's hospital this whole time. The United States Merchant Marine was traveling home after being injured while on board the steamship Ocean Victory. At about 4.30 a.m., he awoke to find the ship listing heavily and the passageways entirely empty. Uncertain if he was awake or in a nightmare, he screamed for help as he wandered the passageways but received no answer, finding the massive ocean liner abandoned. He made it to the top decks to find them devoid of life and covered with ropes and nets. 
watching lifeboats drifting away slowly with the dory as passengers. He attempted to climb down one of the nets on the stern and became tangled in it in his confused state. He was thankfully spotted and pulled safely onto a lifeboat. On the bridge, Captain Calamai was assembled with his remaining officers and crew, still hoping to save his floundering ship. The engineers had abandoned their effort and were ordered to abandon ship. His only hope was an inbound Coast Guard tug that was on its way. But as time ticked by, it seemed less and less likely to make it in time. He had a small crew stand by to handle the tow, but soon he even told them to abandon their post. Shortly before 5.30 a.m., he ordered his officers to part. He would stay here on the ship and go down with her. But his officers refused to leave the ship without him, saying that if he didn't leave, neither would they. Only after a great amount of coaxing was the captain convinced to leave, departing the ship at 5.30 a.m. Captain Calamai was the last man off the Andrea Doria. Dawn came as ships departed to return survivors to New York. Captain Calamai watched from lifeboat 11 as his ship slowly heeled over onto her side. U.S. Coast Guard cutter Hornbeam arrived around shortly after 9 a.m. and took the captain on board. By this time, the ocean liner was listing 50 degrees to starboard, and it was an obvious determination that she couldn't be saved or towed. Planes flew in low, taking photographs and videos of the dying ship, like vultures circling a dying beast. Finally, at around 9.45 a.m., the ship lurched over onto its side and began its final descent, water crashing over the bow as it dipped under. The rest soon followed, the lifeboat still on the port side finally breaking away as the ship slid under. Finally, at 10.09, the name Andrea Doria on the white stern slipped under the waves and disappeared into bubbling foam. It had taken nearly 11 hours exactly to sink. In total, 46 people had perished aboard Andrea Doria. Five perished during the rescue efforts, and five perished aboard the Stockholm. So, the conclusion. Who was at fault here? Who was to blame? Was the Stockholm really to the Andrea Doria's starboard? Or was Andrea Doria to Porta the Stockholm? Do we believe the radar plots of the Junior Karstens? Or the experienced seaman's eye of the bridge team on Andrea Doria? A court hearing was adjourned, a fact-finding trial to establish what had occurred. Who was at fault? And most importantly, who would pay the one million in damages to the Stockholm and the 30 million total loss of the Doria? Not to mention the millions in settlements from the passengers. Several issues came to light, the first being the poor ship handling by the helmsman of the Stockholm, shown in the ship's track, as well as the glaring issues in Karsten's radar plot, showing that the ship was traveling far faster than possible from what he plotted. It became speculated that he may have had the radar set to an incorrect range. He revealed that he had never received formal training on the device. But other issues appeared on Doria. Captain Calamai revealed that he never performed a radar plot, and in fact, didn't even know really how to do one, having always left the job to his officers. It was also revealed that he had failed to save the ship's logs, leaving it to a junior officer that confused the orders, the logs going down with the ship. These logs could have shown the Doria's exact location and either admonished or condemned her. The Andrea Doria had indeed turned port for a vessel on her bow, but with shoal water to starboard and the Stockholm apparently to her starboard, this wasn't necessarily a bad move. But the most damning thing was the failure to slow down in fog and the failure to ballast down the ship. It became apparent quickly that the Doria could have been saved if those fuel tanks were full of seawater. Once this was revealed, both lines settled out of court. The Italian line agreeing to cover the cost of their own ship. The court case was dropped without any conclusive findings, leaving the rest to speculation. Today, you can actually take a ride on board the Stockholm. Barely recognizable as such, the ship is still operated to this day as the motor vessel Astoria. The Andrea Doria's bell on display in the ship. As for the Doria herself, she's now a popular, if not a bit dangerous, diving location. Originally laying in about 160 feet of water, the ship is constantly bombarded by the heavy currents off the coast of Massachusetts. Called the Mount Everest of scuba diving, the wreck has been an alluring challenge for hundreds of divers over the years, but risks such as debris, cables, falling objects, and trawler nets have claimed the lives of 22 scuba divers since 1956, nearly half the number of people that died in the initial collision. As the wreck slowly deteriorates over time, it affords more entrances into the wreck, but more hazards as well. Andrea Doria was a symbol of maritime beauty and national pride 
taken far before her time. A premonition of the end of ocean liners and a specter of change for transatlantic travel. Mistakes were made that ended with terrible loss of life. But who made the fatal error? We may never know. But in remembering the Andrea Doria, we shouldn't dwell on the errors made, but the bravery and skill of the rescuers that kept a tragedy from becoming a disaster of monumental proportions. Thank you so much for tuning into another Maritime Horrors videos. This one was very much a long time coming, but I'm thankful folks stuck around and were patient with me. Life has been nuts with traveling all over, attending classes for my licenses and master's papers, so life has just been piling up on me. But I'm back now and able to dedicate even more time to my channel and making context, so expect more very soon. I'd like to thank my patrons for sticking through this hiatus. You guys are very awesome. I'm sorry for going quiet on all of you. I'd like to thank everyone who subscribed. You're all my shipmates. I decided I want to make some patches for the channel, mostly because I just wanted patches, but my channel artist convinced me to make a bunch to sell as merch as well. So I said, why the heck not? They're available on her Etsy, linked below. Go buy them if you want them. All proceeds go to her because she's awesome and puts in way more effort than me. My channel artist also started her own Twitch where you can chat with her while she makes her art. Go check it out and give her a follow. Link in the description below. All my other merch is in the description as well. Again, that all goes to her as well. But thank you so much for watching. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And fair winds of following CST shipmates.